This is my old workbench, and this is my new workbench. And this is my small shop. My really small shop. And because space is a premium, I needed to build a workbench that pulls multiple duties. So I'm gonna show you how I designed and built the perfect workbench for a small workshop. After filling three garbage bags of sawdust, I was ready to laminate the boards that make up my legs and my aprons and my rails so that they can be a little chunkier. Then I went back to the milling process to take those parts down to final dimension and created another half a dozen bags of sawdust. This design will have panels that enclose the sides and back. I guess you could call this a shaker style workbench, but I feel like that term gets thrown around a little too willy nilly, so I'll refrain from calling it that ever again. Anyways, the panel stock was milled up, filling 11 more bags of sawdust and then glued up using biscuits for alignment. I forgot to mention a couple of things. First, this bench is made out of ash. Second, if you want to make this bench, you can by buying these plans, link in the description. Third, for the joinery, I used dowels. I used dowels to join the aprons and rails to the legs of my bench. Dowels don't seem to get a lot of loving in the YouTube space because the almighty influencers like their fancy dominoes, but I don't have a domino so that I can be a woodworker of the lay people. And people, no dowels. Because we've all put something together from Ikea with dowels in it, but I promise you, dowels are super strong when used with real wood. The jig I'm using is called the Dowel Max, and they sent me their jig a while back because I was having trouble with two other dowel jigs that I own. This jig, hands down, is the best dowel jig I've used by many orders of magnitude. There is an affiliate link in the description if you want to check out the Dowel Max. I almost got through everything without making a mistake, but at the very end, I had the jig flipped around and drilled where I shouldn't have. No biggie. I plugged the holes, flush trimmed them, and re-drilled accordingly. The panels get a half inch rabbit on all four sides using a dado stack and the table saw. I needed dados in the aprons and rails and legs to accept the panels. I set up a quarter inch wing bit slot cutter thing on the router table so I can make stop dados on the legs. I cut the same groove in the side rails, but then I realized I wouldn't be able to fit the long rails on my router table without it hitting the wall. So I set up my box joint blade and my table saw, and I opened up the door to the storage room behind my shop so that I could cut the- Hold the phone, stop the bus, put it in park. There's something that really bugs me that happened here. Do you see it? Right there, right, it's right there. My original bench was never built to be an outfeed table, so it was always a bit lower than my table saw, but I never liked that. The problem is that I see so many people here on the YouTubes and on the Instagrams with outfeed tables that are lower than the table saw. Why? It makes no sense. You don't have an outfeed table, you have an out catch table. It defeats the purpose of an outfit table if your workpiece is unsupported as it exits the cut. And that, people, is what grinds my gears. In other words, not the safest thing, not the most accurate thing, and really just not the most fun thing to have to deal with. So just put some leveling feet on your outfit table so you can get it in the same plane as your table saw. Make sure you don't skimp on these. Remember, for a small shop, this workbench has to wear many hats, so the leveling feet need to be substantial. And, if you don't believe me, Ask my buddy John how well his are holding up. Not looking to give these a good review on Amazon. That's why I installed these hefty machined aluminum ones with threaded inserts on the bottom of my legs. There is a jam nut to ensure that they stay put at the correct height. But Scott, now my miter gauge won't work. So just extend your table saw's miter slots by routing into your tabletop. I made a quick template that hooked on the back of my top and I used a spiral bit and a collar to guide me. MBD. So we have leveling feet, we have miter slots, but I think there is a third thing that needs to be considered if you want your workbench to double as an outfeed table. And that is a place to clear off your top for when you want to use your table saw. Small shops don't have extra room for spare work surfaces, so this is one reason why I built my drawer cabinet shorter with a shelf on top so that I can quickly shove everything that's on top underneath so I don't get into a pickle mid-rip. I'm a big fan of pre-finishing. I'm a big fan. The way the rails and the aprons and the panels of this design are all offset really allows you to pre-finish without having to worry about flush sanding any mating surfaces that are in the same plane. 
The name of the game is to sand everything, then finish everything individually. And it's as simple as that. No getting on your hands and knees, trying to get in every nook and cranny while fighting drips and buildups and corners and all that nonsense. I used Osmo Pollux because I'm trying to simplify, trying to Marie Kondo my finishing process. The glue up was going to be a little tricky. There are a lot of parts to this, so trying to glue it up all at once was going to be next to impossible. So sub assemblies are the ticket here, and I started by gluing the back together. The front was next, which was similar to the back, but a lot simpler since there's no panels or dividers. This was already pushing the limits of the space I had to glue up on top of my bench, so there was no way that I was going to be able to glue up the rest of it. So now was time to say goodbye to my faithful old bench that gave me many fond memories and it was wonder- ah, this thing was a piece of crap, so screw that. The rest of the glue up, albeit a little intimidating, went without a hitch. There was enough wiggle and bend to be able to glue up one side at a time. Even without the bench, this was still a struggle to glue up in my tiny shop, and an assembly table would have been really nice right about now. A great assembly table should be flat. Dead flat? Flat enough? How flat is flat enough? I mean, if you ask five woodworkers this question, you're probably going to get five different answers, ranging from half of a tenth of a thou to slightly better than a urinal trough. I mean, my old bench, which was like six years old, had a dish in it that was about a quarter of an inch deep. And it was kind of a pain, but it really didn't affect the outcome of my past projects. Many woodworkers preach the advantage of a torsion box top for your assembly table or even workbench. And from what I can gather, there's really one main advantage because a torsion box is a webbed frame that has a sheet on top and bottom that are glued and screwed, it is very rigid. Yet many people preach that you can only achieve a dead flat surface with a torsion box. I'm not really sure where that logic comes from because you can apply those same flattening methods with a very strong support structure and achieve a top that's flat enough for woodworking. The surface of your assembly table might be prone to collecting little bits of dry glue and that might cause dents in your work pieces if you're not careful. Laminating a product like Formica on your top is a great way to be able to easily pop off bits of dry glue. I wanted my bench top to be super strong so some sort of support structure would definitely help. I started by screwing in the long parts into the front and back aprons, then I could mark each cross piece's length with a knife and cut to size. I then proceeded to drill a bunch of more holes for dowels, which I then subsequently glued together, and I put the whole frame back in place with all the screws. I wanted the top itself to be super beefy, so I started by cutting down one piece of MDF to the exact size of the top, and I cut down another three quarter inch piece of MDF to just oversized. I used my favorite product, contact cement, to bond them together because I love the smell. Not really, I just don't have a vacuum bag big enough to fit this top. Once they were bonded together, I used my router with a flush trim bit to make the bigger one the exact same size as the smaller one. I wrestled the top back down into my basement to apply some hardwood edge banding. I mitered the corners because I'm extra, no other reason. I used biscuits to align and to strengthen this joint because gluing hardwood to the edge of MDF is really not that strong. You can see that I left the edge banding a little wider than the top is thick so that I could take my trusty flush trim bit in my router to make it perfect. I then heaved the top back out in my garage once again to apply more contact cement and laminate down this sheet of graphite gray Formica. Formica was oversized, so I used the sponsor of this segment, the flush trim bit, to make it perfect. I also broke the edge using a chamfer bit because the Formica gets really sharp. I want to talk about work holding or how you can secure the wood that you're using to your bench temporarily so you can work on it and it doesn't move around everywhere. This usually involves your top and is super important. There's a rule of thumb about how a workbench needs to be able to hold a piece of wood in three different orientations. With a face pointing up, with an edge pointing up, and with an end pointing up. But I would argue that this advice is not the best for a lot of people. Well, I guess for me because I can quite honestly say that I very rarely need to hold a board up on end because I don't really hand cut dovetails or get freaky with hand tools at all. 
If you like doing these things, you can pick up one of those fancy twin screw vices for a hefty chunk of change, but a simple cast iron front vise is much less expensive and can still hold the board in any direction reasonably well. Some people even go without a vise and they're able to hold their work pieces down with dog holes or integrated T-track or I don't know, maybe they just sit on it or something. There are tons of accessories to be had for using T-Track in your bench top. You've got your side clamps, you have other clamps and stops, and I think that's it. Maybe I'm missing something here, but I think there are way more accessories for dog holes and they're just quicker and simpler to use and implement. You can yell at me all you want in the comments if you think T-Track is better, but for dog holes, you have awesome things like track clamps and you have hold down clamps and you have plane stops and you have dogs and these can be used with the dog in your vise for clamping big panels and you also have really tall dogs and side clamps and other things. There's so much more for dog holes, which is why I went with dog holes on my bench. To make the most out of these future options, I wanted to make these holes as accurate as I possibly could. First, I commanded my friend Suman to make me a template on his small CNC because I don't own a CNC or one of those barf guides, I think they're called. Next, I clamped it down. Then I marked the center of each hole using a point of a 20 millimeter Forstner bit and I used a smaller Forstner bit to hog out most of the waste. And this is because I'm going to be using a 20 millimeter straight router bit to make these holes, but these kinds of straight router bits do not like to be plunged. The template was made to use with a brass guide bushing, and that gets the hole exactly where it needs to be, but the unfortunate thing is that this bit only goes about halfway down, so I used the 20 millimeter Forstner bit again to complete the hole. I designed the template such that the leftmost column of holes are not used with the router, but they're actually exactly the same diameter as the dog holes, so I can slide it over and use dogs to put into the holes I've already plunged into the top so that it makes an exact reference for the next set of holes. I put a small chamfer around the top of the dog holes to avoid any accidents and then I flipped the top over and put a huge honking chamfer on the underside of each. You see, I love to use these track clamps for holding down work pieces. I find they're way more secure than others, but these only work if they're going through about three quarter inches thick of a bench top. Otherwise, they can't make the turn. They just get stuck. By making a three quarter inch humongous chamfer, it effectively reduces the top to about three quarters of an inch just around the hole. It's called a compromise for a reason, people. And now the top is done and is way flatter and bigger than my old bench top. But how big should your small shop's workbench be? Since this is a small shop, then I should have a small workbench, right? I know this is gonna sound counterintuitive, but you need to prioritize having a decent sized workbench no matter how small your shop is. Just think about how much time you spend at your workbench versus any other machine in your shop. So make it as big as you possibly can because I would rather sacrifice having a smaller machine or eliminating something like the drill press so I can have a bigger workbench if that's what it takes. I know that sounds a bit rich coming from me. It goes without stating the very obvious that you need a way to shift your bench around when things get hairy. I opted to use these flip down casters that still allow me to rest the bench down on the beefy leveling feet that I installed. I also got these plates so that I can quickly remove the casters so I don't go flying when I inevitably trip over them. If your small shop is in a basement like mine is, then make sure to make a bench that you're gonna be able to fit through doorways get up staircases and get around tight corners. I wanna be able to take the top off mine and remove the bottom cabinet to make it easier to move out of my small basement shop. So if you're in a situation like I am, something like a big Rubo isn't gonna be your friend. Speaking of the bottom cabinet, I designed it dead simple to make because the bench is already super strong. So the cabinet just has to be somewhere to screw the drawer slides to. The sides of the cabinet receive a couple of rabbits each so I could screw it all together with the top and bottom. The two middle dividers were pocket screwed from the inside. I milled up a one inch strip to trim out the top edge so it overhangs over the drawer fronts and I used some biscuits here to help me line things up. I also milled up some thin quarter inch strips to dress out the bottom sides and dividers and I clamped it all down with some painters tape while the glue dried. Then I used the trusty flush trim bit to make it all smooth. 
Then I heaved the whole cabinet up the stairs and out to my garage where I got to work laminating the top with leftover bits of Formica, and that's when disaster struck. Oh no! I just spilled a whole fucking can of contacts in my... I have no idea what to do. Yeah. I don't the sand. Sand is good. I'm gonna dump the sand on it. Fucking hell. Oh, I got my router in it. Oh my god. After that episode behind me, I got back to work laminating the Formica. I was a little rattled and frustrated at this point, and I was rushing just to get out of there. So I ended up getting a lot of that sand cement mix into the contact cement, which resulted in a less than stellar final result on this Formica. And I went to bed and I woke up and I got to work flush trimming and chamfering the edges so that it could be somewhat acceptable in the end. I screwed some scrap blocks to the bottom rails of the carcass so that I could screw the cabinet into place. And putting that cabinet into place was a little easier said than done. I think I spent about five minutes trying to stuff it in, so I probably should have left a little bit of wiggle room when I built it. There you go. So what about the drawers that are gonna go into this cabinet? You wanna hear something mind-blowing? Storage is a huge issue for small workshops. It goes without saying that drawers are a huge lifesaver when it comes to organizing your small shop, so you should maximize every cubic foot of volume down low with drawers. And a workbench is a perfect place to put drawers full of all the tools you need close at hand when working. Drawers are for sure more efficient use of space and they give you better access than a simple shelf or a cupboard would, as long as you keep them well organized and not just a catch-all for random stuff. I intentionally figured out each drawer before I even built them so I could make sure that everything would fit in the best, most efficient way possible and to make sure that the drawers would be made to the correct sizes. To make the drawer boxes, I cut down a whole bunch of half inch Baltic birch for all my parts, and that includes the drawer bottoms, just so they're a little beefier too. I cut a half inch rabbit on the edges of the sides to accept the front and back, and then the same rabbit on the bottom edge for all the box parts for the drawer bottom to fit into. This makes a very quick box to make and assemble because you don't have to fiddle around with changing setups and everything just fits together easy. I glued and brad nailed these together for the sake of time because I'm feeling the burn of this huge project right about now. But I went back and sunk a bunch of 3 16 inch birch dowels to reinforce everything. I cut a scrap piece of quarter inch MDF to the height of the top row of drawer slides, which is used to screw those slides into the cabinet. I went and cut the height of the spacer down for the next row and repeated until I had all my drawer slides evenly spaced. To install the boxes, I laid the bottom row down on a piece of quarter inch MDF. Then I slowly pulled the box and slides out at the same time to sink the first screw in. Then I could pull it out a little bit more to sink the middle screw in and then I could take the box completely out and sink the last screw on the back of the slide. The next rows of drawer boxes were mounted in much the same fashion. I just used spaces on top of the row of boxes underneath. The drawer fronts are going to be a simple frame and panel design which I'm sure you've seen before. I want a continuous grain wherever possible between parts so I made sure to make some marks so I don't get confused. You can see that when they're cut up, the grain flows nicely between the rails and styles. Those rails and styles needed a half inch deep by quarter inch groove centered down the inside edge, and the rails received a half inch tenon that fits into the groove in the styles. I made the panels out of one large panel that I resawed, milled up, and glued together. I sanded and pre-finished the entire panel at once because this is going to be much more efficient than doing a bunch of little panels. And I cut the large panel up into smaller panels for each of the drawer fronts. And this also allows me to make continuous grain between each panel. 
Each of the smaller panels received a rabbit on all fur sides, which fit into the grooves in the rails and styles. To glue it up, I do not put glue on the panel, but only on the tenons, and I make sure to keep that panel floating centered within the drawer front. To mount them, I trim them to size, and I use some of this 16th inch veneer I have to make spacing between the cabinet and the drawer faces. I then can clamp it down, pull it out, and send some screws in through the back of the drawer box to secure the drawer front. I could then apply some finish on the rail and styles to complete the look. But I'm not done yet. I need some drawer pulls so I can open these drawers. I made this template that fits into the opening of the frame and panel, and this has holes that perfectly mark where the holes need to be to mount the drawer pulls to the drawer front. I could take this template, trim it down evenly on top and bottom to fit into the narrower drawer fronts above. And with that, the bench is done. This bench solves so many issues for me and my small shop. I have so many drawers now that I can stuff all the things in that used to be under my old bench. The height of the tabletop is now level with the table saw. The dog holes are gonna be super sick to work with. The top is so much bigger in surface area than my old top. It's super flat and it's so rigid. I can't even rack it if I tried. The dowels just make it so much stronger than my old workbench and it just looks phenomenal. I just love it. What about me? Screw you!